And a very good morning to you. How you doing? Sunday morning, April 7th, 2019. It's a lovely morning here in Manchester. I've been up for hours. I've been up for hours, I tell you. I'm in good form. This is Sunday View. You know this. This is why you've tuned in. Going to take a look at the front pages of Sunday's newspapers over the course of the next hour. Look at some of the stories inside and we'll hear some audio from some of the Sunday morning news programs as well. All right. How does that sound to you? Sounds pretty good. Welcome. Asking the questions mainstream journalists will never ask. This is your Richie Allen Show on RichieAllen.co.uk. Fab Radio 2 in Manchester and TriggerWarning.tv Indeed, just about got the theme tune in. Ah, mishaps with the technicalities. It happens, it happens, it happens. Right, Sunday View, then tweet the programme. You know you can do that. Tweet me right now. Welcome, welcome. It's the Richie Allen Show, broadcasting live on RichieAllen.co.uk and multiple platforms around the world. And now, here's your host, Richie Allen. Yes, it's at Richie Allen Show. If you're new to the program and you're listening for the first time, it's at Richie Allen Show on Twitter. Lots to talk about, so let's uh, ixnay the old theme tune there and just crack on with it. Are you having a good weekend, are you? You're not? You're telling me you're not? You've been working double shifts over the weekend? I hear you. I hear you. Lovely here in the Northwest. It's apparently going to be sunny and very warm this afternoon. That's nice then, if that's the case. It was a bit grey and a bit overcast this morning. Hey, wait till I tell you. Wait till I tell you. I popped into my local news agents, and while there conversing with my friend, my cinema-going friend, Michael, we went to see the remake of Pet Cemetery on Friday, Stephen King's book. Now, I've read every Stephen King book. Some of them I've read several times like The Stand, like The Running Man, which was written under the pseudonym Richard Bachman, which is, for me, one of the most important books I ever read. Anyway, Pet Cemetery was made way back when, in the early 90s, and a very good job was made of it. This remake is a disgrace to celluloid. It's a disgrace to film. So many people walked out before the end of it. I said to me, mate, Michael, why did we not walk out, Michael? We just didn't. <laughs> we stuck around. Nearly as bad as Glass with uh, Samuel L. Jackson and the Scottish actor. Dreadful stuff. But don't take my word for it. Go and waste your own 15 quid or 13 quid. My local cinema, it's £10.60. and pence. I'll never see that again. But anyway, this morning I was in the newsagents and I was in kind of... I'm very manic in the mornings. Especially after I come from my run. When I'm finished my 5k, 6k run, I'm kind of hyper and manic for a few minutes. Maybe it didn't wear off today, maybe. And there's a lovely student ahead of me in the in the queue and he tapped the old contactless. Because I'm manic and hyperactive, I had a go with him in a very jokey, funny way about it. And this student was no snowflake whatsoever. He was a lovely lad. He was very interested. What are you talking about, he said to me. So I spoke to him for a couple of minutes outside the shop about um, contactless payments and the danger of a time in the future when there is no cash and why that might benefit maybe a totalitarian government or three or five. And it was lovely. He was very engaging, the lad. Very interested. He said, I never thought of that. He said, I often actually don't even pay with the card. These days... I pay it with my iPhone. And I said, I know. When you get back to uni, have a think about it. But he was good. It was good that somebody was actually interested and asked me some questions. Interesting lad. You know, because I, I do give younger people a hard time sometimes. I'm well aware of it. And um, it was good to meet somebody with a bit of interest. Uh, genuinely curious. And said, I've never considered that, he said. Well, I said, neither did I. When I was um, going through college and uni and all the rest of it, the importance of being able to do transactions with one another outside of the scope of the government, as it were. Anyway, Sunday View, Sunday View, Sunday Telegraph, let's start with the Telegraph. Furious Tory activists go on strike as May woos Corbyn. Are you eating your breakfast? You are. Picture Jeremy Corbyn and Theresa May in the nip, in bed, getting it on end of breakfast. Listen to this, listen to this programme. 
This is the diet. This is the diet that'll help you lose weight. Picture Corbin May in the nude in the sack. Is that ageism? You're damn right it is. Now, conservative activists are refusing to campaign for the party and donations have dried up apparently because members are cheesed off that Theresa May has betrayed them over Brexit and the government has lost touch with the voters. This is according to council candidates. They've written a letter to the Prime Minister. More than 100 current councillors, this is local politics now, okay, local, locally elected councillors. So more than 100 current councillors and would-be councillors, Conservative Party, said they cannot muster volunteers to go and knock on doors and fight next month's local elections because there is no belief in the party. There's no belief in the party, Theresa. Here's the letter, or some of it anyway. Dear Prime Minister, forward slash chairman of the party, as council candidates and campaigners who are out talking to voters in our wards across the country for the forthcoming local elections, we're all hearing the same message over and over again from the people we meet on the doorstep. They're telling us that the government has not delivered the Brexit promised in the 2017 manifesto. Conservative manifesto. Overwhelmingly, it was leavers who voted Conservative at the last election and they will not vote for us now. Support for the party around the country is in free fall because our voters think we've broken our promises to them. The message comes back loud and clear they want us to leave the European Union now and with the Brexit they were promised. They don't want more fudge. They don't want more delay or extension. They don't want another referendum. They don't want any more broken manifesto promises. They want to leave. And they don't want to see power over Brexit handed over to Jeremy Corbyn, whom they rightly distrust as an extremist and terrorist sympathiser. Hmm, Jeremy Corbyn. He's a big... I said it'd be... What, what a, don't, don't, don't get into Corbyn bashing today, Richie. Don't get into it. Corbyn is useless. <laughs> He's absolutely useless. Anyway. So also writing in the Sunday Telegraph today, Andrea Leadsom, the leader of the House, says another referendum would be a betrayal. Joe Platt is a Labour front bencher who represents Lee in Greater Manchester. She said it would confirm to voters their voice is held as second rate in Westminster. The newspapers reporting this morning further resignations by Theresa May are on the cards this week if she agrees to a long extension and carries on with the Corbyn meetings and all the rest of it. There's massive disgust, by the way, dear listener, at the prospect of the UK taking part in European Parliament elections next month. Now, there's going to be a, a meeting about this on Wednesday. Theresa May is going to go to the European Council and meet with them about the prospect of European Council elections. If I thought there was a snowball's chance in hell <laughs> that I could be elected as a member of the European Parliament, I'd never do it. I'm only joking. I would never do it. Not in a million years. I would be a hypocrite if I did that. I wouldn't do it. Ledsom says taking part in these elections two months after the intended departure date would be a national embarrassment. It would be, Andrea. It would be a disgrace, love. Of course. Now, I explained back in late 2016 why May hadn't triggered Article 50. First of all, dear listener, the whole idea of Article 50 was slipped in years ago by the European Union to basically give it time to reverse any country's decision to leave. Article 50 means that when a country signals its intention to leave, it then has two years to do a deal on future relationship and trade and all of that with the European Union. In reality, that's the official side of it. In reality, it's a massive scam to give the fascist dictatorship more time to figure out how do we get to reverse it. Right. And I pointed out, and thank you, those of you who have acknowledged that I pointed this out, because I couldn't be arsed going back through dozens of radio programmes to dig out that little bit of audio 
it's actually more than a little bit of audio. I said it many times. Thank you for not asking me to do that. I said it that the reason she didn't trigger Article 50 on June 24th, 2016 was deliberate. It was down to the fact that European Parliament elections were coming up in May of 2019. So they delayed the triggering of Article 50 till the end of March 2017 to run the exit date right into the European elections. Of course, it's all about humiliation and debasement of a whole nation for many reasons, not, not, not least of which to show other European Union countries. This is what happens if you try to leave us. Watch The Sopranos. Watch The Godfather. Look at Tony Soprano when he's talking to Eugene and to Chris Maltesanti and they burn the picture of the Virgin Mary and they prick their fingers and they swear a blood oath. Tony says to them, you know once you're in this fucking thing, there's no leaving it ever, except feet first in a pine box. And that's the way it is with the European Union. Right? More on this in a minute, because I had to laugh this morning. Also on the front page of the Sunday Telegraph today, the story, Duke joins ranks of Her Majesty's Secret Service. Right? Duke joins ranks of Her Majesty's Secret Service. What's it all about? Well, here's Stephen Dixon's Sky News to tell you. Now, the Duke of Cambridge has spent, apparently, a humbling three weeks working with MI5, MI6 and GCHQ. Prince William spent his placement learning about how the UK's security and intelligence agencies work. The head of counter-terrorism at GCHQ says William worked exceptionally hard on his placements. Yeah. He spent three weeks at GCHQ. What kind of fuckery is this? Mm. <laughs> I think when he was there for three weeks, the future king, because he will be, won't he? You've got old jug ears next whenever the old woman pops her clogs. But of course, she could live to be 125 because the these people, well, they have a few secrets, a few elixirs. They have access to a few more truths about what's really going on than we do. So the old woman could stay for a while. Then you have old Charlie jug ears. So this guy will probably get in when he's in his mid-50s, I'd say. Mid-50s. But he's going to be the king eventually, right. So what's it all about? What happened when he was there for his three-week um, placement? I reckon he had his Hamlet moment. I reckon he had his own Hamlet moment. Just after lunch on Tuesday of his fourth week, he was left alone in the office and he went rummaging through some drawers that were none of his business and he got the evidence, took him back to, took him back to 1998 in Paris and the tunnel. He had his Hamlet moment. Wow! So Grandad really did kill Mummy. <laughs> Marvellous, that bastard. So that's it, really. He spent three weeks there. But look, it's a much bigger story. When will people understand that these alleged ceremonial hipsters, Harry and William and all the rest of it and their parents, are nothing like that which we are told they are? They're just old figureheads, old ceremonial things, throwback, it's great for tourism. No, these people have a big say in uh, your daily reality and in what you're seeing on your daily news. Believe it, it's true. Gotten into it too many times before. The Observer, front page, furious Tory MPs will bid to oust May if the UK fights Europol. This is about the prospect of the parliamentary elections. Furious Tory MPs will oust May. They can't because they tried to oust her just before Christmas and they failed. Or was it January? They failed. The Observer says May is being warned by her mutinous MPs. They will get rid of her within weeks if the UK takes part in European elections next month and extends the EU membership beyond the end of June. Somebody who used to talk to me a lot during my radio days in Spain was Tim Stanley, I like Tim. These days he can't be seen with the likes of me. But he's all right. I forgive him. Uh, Tim Stanley was on Sky News last night. He's a Telegraph 
reporter, journalist, leader, writer. Here's what Tim Stanley said about the about this story that may will have to go if the European elections are contested next month. Tim Stanley. If that does happen, uh, Conservatives are very angry, Conservative MPs are very angry for two reasons. One, because they think it'll be a humiliation that three years after voting to leave the EU, Britain is participating in Euro elections. That in and of itself is an embarrassment and a sign of a failure to launch. But secondly, if those Euros elections do take place, there is a growing fear among Conservatives that the Conservative Party would fare, fare the worst and would be wiped out. Uh, there is a now very well-funded uh, party, the Brexit Party, emerging, which could do rather well in those Euro elections. I have to say, I, I personally suspect Remainers would do just as well, if not better, in that round of elections, because many people who want to overturn the referendum result or want to have a confirmatory referendum are going to come out uh, and vote. Either way, the party that is looking to get squeezed the most is the Conservative Party. So what MPs are saying, and according to the Observer, is that if they are forced to go through this personal humiliation of the Euros, uh, they will then try to oust the Prime Minister, which is all very well, but uh, I don't, unless it's explained inside the newspaper, it's unclear how on earth they would do that. Yes, if you're over a certain age, you'll get this reference. Theresa May is like Vera Vinegar tits in Prisoner Cell Block H or Joan Ferguson. I can't think of another villain that lasted 17 or 20 seasons of a TV show. There's no getting rid of Theresa May. At all. Right. May's job was to destroy the prospect of the UK leaving the European Union. And she's doing a bloody good job of it. So for the very, very immediate time being, she's not going anywhere. Uh, Tory MP, Conservative MP Peter Bone is not happy with the Prime Minister either. She shouldn't say one thing and do do the opposite. She's, well, she didn't say one thing. She said it 108 times. I mean, no wonder people think that this is a humiliation. It is. We, we, I, have, I have to say, if the Prime Minister doesn't change her tact and take us out this week on April the 12th, I think she absolutely has to go. Yeah, of course she does. But she's not going anywhere until the job is done, until we have a very long extension, second referendum, election and all of that. My old pal Jean Ann is among several people who've uh, noticed my little quip about elixirs for the very old, the Rothschilds, the royal families. They live forever, these people. They never die. Right? The Queen Mother, 172, I think, when she popped her clogs. Others, they go on forever. They do have access to elixirs. Elixirs. I had to look that up before I used it this morning. Elixirs. This is another Shakespearean word, of course, I came across during my English studying days. They do. They know more than we do. Absolutely right, they do. Good morning, Jean Ann and Cleggan. It's beautiful on the west coast of Ireland this morning as well. The sun is beating in the window of the studio of the Richie Allen Show, Richie Allen Show Towers. Can't get rid of me. Now, Jacob Rees Mogg, terminological inexactitude, darling. All but describes Theresa May as a traitor this morning. By the way, don't panic. We're moving away from Brexit in a few minutes' time. But Mug is on the Sophie Ridge on Sunday programme. And he all but describes May as a traitor. All but. But the implication of what he tells Ridge is very clear indeed, Jacob Rees. Mug, Sophie Ridge. The reason the Prime Minister hasn't been able to get all Conservative MPs to back her deal is that she failed to deliver on the promises she made in the Conservative Party manifesto in the Lancaster House speech and in the Mansion House speech. She came back with a deal that potentially led to a division between Great Britain and Northern Ireland. So the reason she's in difficulties is her own creation. It's not um, forced upon her. But at the same time, the Conservative Party has failed to back the deal on the table. It's failed to get enough support for a no-deal exit, which some on the backbenchers would like to see. So what is the solution? Well, I, I would question <clears throat> the failed to get enough support for a no-deal that you're quite right that Parliament has passed motions objecting to a no-deal Brexit, but it passed a law, indeed two laws, that provided us for, for us to leave on the 29th of March, subsequently delayed, and law trumps motions, and the Prime Minister could have taken us out on the 29th of March. It was the Prime Minister who asked for an extension. It was a Prime Minister who changed the date by 
and prerogative power from the 29th of March to the 12th of April. This all rests with her and upon her shoulders. She has made, the Prime Minister, Mrs May, has made active choices to stop us leaving and she deserves to be held to account for that because people ought to know the truth of the position rather than trying to blame everybody else, blaming recalcitrant MPs and other Conservatives. If the Prime Minister had done what she'd said in the first place and had stuck to the law as set out in two acts, we would have left the European Union by now. Yeah, I was right to say he all but called her a traitor. The language is very, very strong for any Conservative MP there. You know, she's actively worked to prevent it happening. Law Trump's motions in the House of Commons the country should have left by now. There's a pal of mine who's been listening to this programme for a couple of years or more, and she drops me messages, Coca Bell I'm talking about here. And there was a movement earlier in the week by concerned citizens and businessmen and women to go to the High Court to say that everything that has happened since March 29th is illegal. We should be gone now. And I agree with them, but the law is perverse. The law is corrupt. May is a traitor. This is a fact. We'll come back to that in a minute, traitor. So these are choices made by Theresa May and Ollie Robbins, whom I've spoken a lot about in recent time. He's the civil servant she appointed to lead the Brexit department after the 2017 election, when she um, campaigned on that ridiculous manifesto that was designed to weaken the Conservative Party majority. Okay, okay, that they had won in 2015. Now... This is Ollie Robbins, the man who has conspired with the European Union to destroy Brexit, right? Enemies of the people, traitors. Before we get into that, because this is a big deal, there's been a lot of talk about this over the last few days, about the language. I'm going to be bringing you some audio from a Labour politician called Jess Phillips in a minute, and it might trigger one or two Labour supporters. Good morning to uh, Gail, by the way, who's got the hubster listening for the first time. He's actually got a day off says Gail. Good morning, Gail. Good morning, Mr. Gail. Good morning to Trish Deeney as well. Good morning, Trish. Good morning to Will Endow. Good morning to um, Moinga, to everybody else who's tweeting. It's vibrant this morning. How you doing, Liz? How you doing, Cunnington? That would be Lord Twat Waffle. <laughs> right. Good morning to uh, Hubertes, to Martin, uh, to McHenry as well, to Murray who's listening. Good morning, Murray. Nice to know you're listening in. And Dean Smith, long-time listener and friend of the programme. Good morning, Dean. Right, let's talk about the language and let's talk about these people then. Last week, the Police Chiefs Council said, don't use language like, like that, like treacherous and treason, and don't use language like enemies of the people because it might lead to violence. And they clearly stated that your words might give somebody in their minds, it might give them permission to do something criminal. Of course, that's very dangerous. You, as a human being, are responsible for, for your own thoughts and your own feelings and your own actions. You're also responsible for the actions of your underage children, of course. I would say that you, in the company of other adults, you... you have an inalienable right to say what it is you really feel and not worry that some nut job uh, whom you don't know might run off and punch somebody in the face. What am I saying? I'm not talking about saying things like, I wish somebody would give that Boris Johnson a good kicking. That's not right. People shouldn't say stuff like that. Okay? That's a, that's, that's a motion to... Violence. That's a motion to commit an act of violence. It's recommending it. I'm talking about people saying, well, May is a traitor. Full stop. That should be okay. Listen to the Labour MP, Jess Phillips. She was speaking with Sophie Ridge this morning. Her constituency is Birmingham Yardley. And I know people who live there. And I, when we do the demographics every few months of the listeners to the Richie Allen show, I tend to have a lot of listeners in places where there is a lot of economic deprivation because people are looking for an alternative point of view. So they find programmes like this, not just my programme, but other programmes, right? This is a fact. I grew up in economic deprivation myself and I, I have a lot of sympathy for people living in areas where there isn't much going on in terms of work and stuff like that. 
Now, in Birmingham Yardley, all four wards voted to leave, massively voted to leave the European Union because there is a lot of poverty there, unemployment is off the charts, and 35% child poverty of children there living in poverty. Now, I don't believe that Jess Phillips gives a damn about her constituents. I know there are people who I'm still in contact with who work in the mainstream, and they would say to me, that's a very, very unkind and a very unprofessional thing to say, Richie. You don't know anything about that woman. I've never met her. But I've spent the best part of two years listening to Jess Phillips. Here she is with Sophie Ridge this morning, talking about her constituency, the fact they voted to leave. But before she gets into that, we get a beautiful bit of virtue signalling from the very wealthy Jess Phillips. Have a listen. Yeah. By the end of every day, I am exhausted with vicarious trauma for the lives of my constituents. She's exhausted at the end of every day with vicarious trauma for the lives of her constituents. That's a monumental lie. That, that would blow up a lie detector machine, that. It would actually blow it to pieces. Jess Phillips couldn't give a damn about her constituents, and I'm going to explain why in a minute. Listen to what she says about the vote to leave. I mean, obviously, it's not all bad, but the people I see are the people in crisis, and I see them all day, every day. I am so angry that their lives matter so little. In your constituency, all four wards voted to leave the EU. Yeah. And you support a second referendum. Nobody who voted leave here. Listen to this now. She's now going to try and explain what the people of Birmingham Yardley were thinking when they voted to leave, right? Did leave here has a massive go at me. I mean, you get the odd one who will send don't, you don't, angry. Don't they want you to respect their vote, though? I mean, and to if, carry it out? But if they do, that's not what they're saying to me. They trust me. Lawyer. Trust me to try and do the best thing for them. Not all of them, but no constituency is full of people who universally support the Member of Parliament. I mean, my constituents don't all think the same thing. They didn't all vote leave because they hate immigrants. They didn't all, I mean, lots of them are immigrants. Uh, they didn't all vote leave because uh, they wanted to take back control. They didn't all vote leave because they hated the customs union. They all have different reasons. The vast majority of people voted leave because they wanted to show the system that they weren't happy ah they wanted to show the system that they're not happy there is some element of truth in that when she said they didn't vote to leave because they wanted to be out of the customs union and all the rest of it she's lying through her teeth this is a despicable woman and a disgusting human being that constituency as much as any other in the country overwhelmingly voted to leave i'll tell you why they voted to leave in a minute so forget that she's ignoring the customs union and immigration and all the rest of it, which was a massive reason why people chose to leave. She then got into saying they voted to leave because they wanted to kind of stick their fingers up at the system. People voted leave because they wanted to show the system that they weren't happy. They wanted to show the system that they weren't happy. So what does the system do? And who can blame them? Who can blame them, right? But what does the system do then? Who can blame them? But when... Look, my constituents are... Lots of them may well disagree with my position, the position that I have come to. I didn't get Nearly all of them do. Didn't get there easily, but the position I've come to is that Parliament can no longer deal with this. Ah, Parliament can no longer deal with this, so we'll put it back to the people. <laughs> and they may well disagree with me, and that is democracy. And if they disagree with me, they don't have to vote for me. And I may lose my job, but frankly, their jobs are more important. Yeah, their jobs are more important. Keep that in mind. She signed off with that. I might lose my job, and she should. It doesn't matter who comes in instead of Jess Phillips in Birmingham Yardley. Nothing will ever change politically. But she'd love to see her punished and turfed out on her fat arse where she belongs. Their jobs are more important to me, she said. She's a liar. She doesn't care. This is a mouthpiece for the Labour Friends of Israel, a Zionist lobbying group. You wonder, has any of the constituents in Birmingham Yardley ever said to Jess Phillips, we've got nothing here, love. We've got nothing. Our children are starving. What are you doing meeting with the Labour Friends of Israel? Shouldn't you be trying to attract businesses here? Anything where we can go to work and pay our bills and keep roofs over our heads. Jess Phillips. People in Birmingham Yardley 
and in other deprived areas of this country voted to leave the European Union because they are not stupid. Poverty doesn't equate to lack of intelligence. Poor people read too. I know. I grew up in a housing estate, the greatest place I ever experienced in my life when we left it. When we left Ballybeg when I was 12 years old, it took me years to get over it. Working class estate, filled to the brim with the best people on the planet. Right? Who had nothing. But they were intelligent. They read. They were politically active. Poverty doesn't equate to stupidity. Why did people in Birmingham Yardley decide to leave the European Union? Because they saw that manufacturing was destroyed by membership of the European Union. For the millionth time on this programme, I've laid this out step by step how it happened. And not only was manufacturing destroyed, but what manufacturing jobs were left? Semi-skilled jobs for people who didn't stay in school. Not stupid now, but people who couldn't go into establishment work. Factory jobs were then taken by low-skilled migrant workers from Europe whose, whose parent countries, where they were living, they were often earning £2, £2.50 pence an hour. They could double their wages by coming to places like Birmingham and elsewhere. So all of a sudden, low-skilled, semi-skilled people are competing with thousands of people from outside of their country. It's not their fault either. We've gotten into this. What did that lead to? Deprivation. Massive impact on on vital public services. And Jess Phillips thinks that her very poor, and not all of them, but many of them, very badly off constituents are stupid. That they didn't know what was going on when they had the opportunity, opportunity to leave. Jess Phillips is a traitor to the people of Birmingham Yardley who in all four wards voted in astonishing numbers to leave the European Union. She's a traitor to be a member of a group like the Labour Friends of Israel as are the Conservative Friends of Israel members as well. All of them. Treasonous. Working with a foreign lobbying group against the interests of their own country. Jess Phillips and Nick Robinson at the BBC introduces her as the minister for saying it the way it is. She's been in national magazines presented as this great working class woman, this woman who sticks up for people who tells it the way it is. She's a disgrace. And even though it doesn't matter which politician replaces Jess Phillips, just for the crack, people of Birmingham Yardley, when you get the opportunity to rid yourselves of Jess Phillips, kick her into fucking touch. And I mean metaphorically. Get rid of her in a landslide. Doesn't matter who you get, it won't change. But get rid of her. Ah, on this long extension the Tusk has asked for, Donald Tusk has suggested a long extension for over a year. May has asked for an extension. Not for a year, but she wants an extension. The extension could in theory be vetoed by any one of the remaining EU 27 member states. In theory, right? Because there has to be unanimity among member states on this. And if you remember uh, Christopher Moncton, Lord Moncton of Brenchley, was on this programme a few weeks ago. And he said, I wish one of these right wing uh, prime ministers and presidents in Europe would veto this. And he was on to something there, was Christopher Moncton. But I don't hold out any hope. In theory, somebody like uh, Viktor Orban in Hungary, for example, he's a Eurosceptic. If he wanted to stick it to the European Union, he could veto the delay. Veto it, meaning that on Friday next, the UK would just leave the European Union, right? But they won't veto it, these guys, because they are Trojan horses. All of these alleged alternative right politicians. Don't believe for a minute they're sincere. Look at Greece. But I did have to laugh over the weekend. The Irish Taoiseach Leo Varadkar, the happy Indian, uh, threatened any state that might veto. Now, to be threatened by Leo Varadkar, you're, this is vaudeville. I mean, you're really in the twilight zone here. Listen to Leo Varadkar, the happy Indian who currently sits at the head of the Irish government. If one country was to veto an extension and as a result uh, impose 
hardship on us, real problems for the Dutch, the Belgians and the French as neighbouring countries of the EU, they wouldn't be forgiven for it. Um, and they would know that they might find themselves on the other end of that particular um, veto power in the future. <laughs> wow. Ireland couldn't beat Hartlepool. <laughs> and Varadkar, the puppet who... Uh, this asshole wrote to Kylie Minogue last week, begging to meet her when she arrived in Dublin for a gig. A note that you'd expect from a giggling teenage girl. Tough guy. Tough guy, Leo Varadkar. They'll pay if any, well, if any, uh, if any, uh, if any uh, uh, European country uh, vetoes, uh, uh, they'll pay for it. Uh. No, they won't pay for anything. Merkel came to Dublin last week to basically give this guy who began it, as we say in Ireland. She gave him who began it. Merkel turned up to give it straight to Varadkar. This is what you must do over the course of the next few weeks. Varadkar said, yes, ma'am, three bags full, ma'am. Ireland is a vassal state of the European Union. It hasn't been controlled by an elected Irish government for many decades. It's true what I just said. Shall we have some music and then move away from breakfast, shall we? Shall we? From breakfast? From breakfast? Let's move away from Brexit. This is the Richie Allen Show, Sunday View. The time is 24 minutes to uh, midday. And this is the brilliant Bruce Springsteen with Badlands. Back with more on Sunday View next. Good morning to Troy Hughes. Good morning, Troy, to Samantha Jordan, to Chris Davies. Chris is in sunny Accrington today. Accrington Stanley? Good morning, Chris. Bruce Springsteen, Badlands on the Richie Allen Show, Sunday View, Fab Radio 2, TriggerWarning.tv, TuneIn Radio and RichieAllen.co.uk. A lot of tweets about Jess Phillips and the rest of that long-winded rant there. I'm not going to say any more on it. John says that was uh, quite a dismantling of her. I still maintain that once the lamestream media have got what they wanted from her, they'll dump her like... (laughs) <laughs> a used sock but he didn't quite put it like that did John thank you John that made me grin good morning to Dave Simpson Richie they have taken their payoff. the Zions have the money and the politicians are taking it like the pigs they are says Dave it's pretty strong Dave but I understand it I'm not going to distance myself from your comment because I understand it right I'm going to move on because uh, this is important in the time we have left I think it's important anyway Sunday Times, there's another story about anti-Semitism in the Labour Party. Labour's hate files expose Corbyn's anti-Semite army. The Sunday Times has accused Labour and Corbyn of failing to take action against hundreds of members accused of anti-Semitism under his leadership. Labour says all complaints are fully investigated and staff who uh, were named were fast-tracked. So if... um, Staff were named in reports. They were the investigations were fast tracked. Says Labour, right? Okay. Before we get into that and anti-Semitism, what about the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu? He's been saying that if he's elected again as the Israeli Prime Minister in the forthcoming election, if he wins again, if his party holds the uh, balance of power in the in the uh, what's wrong with you, Richie? The coalition government, yes. If he's uh, basically if he wins again, that he will annex settlements, Palestinian settlements in Gaza. Lovely, this guy. There was a Sky News report on this this morning, which is very unusual, Sky News. Israel's Prime Minister has caused uproar amongst Palestinians and other Arab nations after announcing his plans to annex settlements in the disputed West Bank if he wins another term in office. Israel disputes that the settlements are illegal under international law. The pre-election pledge comes after his campaign fell behind his main challenger in the polls this week. Mr Netanyahu made the statement when he was asked in an interview why he hadn't yet extended sovereignty to the area, as he'd done previously in East Jerusalem and the Golan Heights. I'm going to extend Israeli sovereignty, and I don't distinguish between settlement blocks and the isolated settlements. In my opinion, each block is an Israeli area and is under the Israeli control. We, the Israeli government, have responsibility over these areas. I won't move these blocks to the Palestinian Authority. Mm. The United Nations will do nothing. It will continue to condemn the Israeli government. Uh, nobody will moot sanctioning the country back to the Stone Age. 
which should happen, if it was good enough for South Africa, if it was good enough for Iraq, even though most of what we were told about the Iraqi situation in the 90s was a pack of lies as well, sanction them back to the Stone Age, impoverish the country, block all of its international holdings overseas, squeeze them so hard that the Israeli people will rise up and will burn the House of Parliament to the ground. That's what you need to do with an apartheid terrorist regime like the Israeli government. Nobody's going to do anything about it. So back to anti-Semitism, and you see the timing is incredible here. While Israel continues to murder Palestinians indiscriminately on a daily basis, which happens, and declares that it will, you know, take the Golan Heights for its own, thanks Donald Trump, and it declares it will annex settlements, all of that, you've got this anti-Semitism crap. So the Sunday Times has been accusing Labour, as I said, of failing to deal with hundreds of complaints of anti-Semitism. The Labour Party did put out a statement which said these figures are not accurate, adding lines have been selectively leaked from emails to misrepresent their overall contents. This is interesting. Labour is saying that the enemies of the party, these crazy Zionist hate groups, and they are hate groups, the campaign against anti-Semitism, for example, the Northwest Friends of Israel, they're packed full to the brim of hateful Zionists, lunatics, right? So Labour is saying these guys are taking one or two lines out of emails that might be 10 paragraphs long and using them out of context. Fair enough. Peter Mason is the National Secretary for the Jewish Labour Movement. The Jewish Labour Movement is meeting today and they will be discussing whether or not to basically completely separate itself from this particular Labour Party under Corbyn. So before he headed off to the Labour Movement, the Jewish Labour Movement meeting, the National Secretary Peter Mason was on Sky News this morning. So Mr Mason, Labour has said that the emails have been quoted selectively what say you? That statement is the statement that the Labour Party has put out after every instance of anti-Semitism over the last year, and quite frankly, it's it's it's, it's a worthless statement um, when it's you know uh, when they put it out. You know, the story in the Sunday Times uh, this morning is quite incredible, detailing over 800 complaints of anti-Semitism, 250 of which have not been dealt with. Now, if those figures aren't accurate, as a database leaked to the party or leaked uh, from the party two weeks ago, um, then can somebody pr- please? Please tell me what accurate is. Now, before we hear the question from the presenter, there are lots of official Jewish groups, like Jewish Voice for Labour, who reject utterly the notion that the Labour Party is anti-Semitic and that Corbyn is. So, I know what you're thinking, dear listener. At some stage, either Stephen Dixon, the presenter, or Gillian Joseph, the co-presenter, will jump in and say to this guy, but the, you don't speak for Jews. There are many Jewish identitarians who are members of many different groups and they have a different opinion. So you'd expect that, wouldn't you? So what are you as a movement going to do about it? What's your next move? That's a fair question. That's a good next question. What are you going to do about it? your meeting today? What's the plan? Well, today, the Jewish Labour Movement is holding our annual general meeting. Lovely. And what's going to happen there? Um, and it was a meeting that has been long in the diary. Ah, oh, fuck the diary. What's going to happen there? Which we are going to be discussing amongst a, no- a number of things. Answer the fucking question! Uh, Labour Party anti-Semitism uh, and members having um, only just a few weeks ago voted to remain, albeit um, begrudgingly, because they believe that they should stay and stand and fight within the Labour Party, will be asking quite difficult questions of the Labour Party leadership. Right, right. That was a non-answer. What are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? Now, keep in mind, there are lots and lots of various Jewish groups in the country who do not believe there's a problem with Corbyn and anti-Semitism. So, what are you going to do about it? Tell us when you have this meeting today. Well, look, you know, it wasn't that long ago, just a few short weeks ago, that, that our parliamentary chair, Luciana Berger MP, resigned from the Labour Party citing anti-Semitism. It's not been that long ago since the Labour Party, and the last time I was here, we had a conversation about the party attempting oh, to redefine Christ. anti-Semitism unilaterally in and of itself. The situation is... What are you going to do? Are you going to tear up your 90-odd-year 
allegiance to the Labour Party? It's a simple question. It is getting worse and worse and worse for Jewish Labour Party members. Bullshit. And the Jewish community look on in horror. No, they don't. The Jewish community, I'm lucky enough to know several Jews, locally, by the way, as well as through my job, and they find this very bemusing. They don't. Jewish people are not looking on in horror. They couldn't give a shit, really. That's the truth about it, right? So where's the presenter saying, what about the Jewish voice for Labour? They're big supporters of Corbyn. As a party that we have been affiliated to for 99 years, 99 years of solidarity between the Jewish community and the left. Got to hang on for one more year just for that centenary, don't you? You're not going to leave now, surely. And that looks like it's coming to an end. Uh, what about... What about... Stephen Dixon is interjecting. What about... Surely Stephen is going to say, what about the Jewish Voice for Labour? It's got a massive membership and they totally dispute what you're saying. What about Tom Watson? The oh, fuck off with Tom Watson! It's simple. It's a simple question. I've got listeners who listen to me who've just begun making podcasts. Gather in, children. Here's a journalistic... Here's a journalistic lesson for you. Be the devil's advocate. There are other Jews. I think I can see one from my window. There's other Jews. What about the Jewish voice for Labour? No, he goes on about Tom Watson. Old Tom Watson. Tom Watson, who virtue signals for the Zionists. What about Tom Watson? Leader who says, this, looking at the Times report, this makes for deeply shocking and depressing reading. Labor, oh, God. Labour members and the Jewish community will not understand how, for many, many years on, from the first concerns about anti-Semitism being raised, we have not got to grips with it. I give them my word, I will continue to do everything in my power to rid our party. Yeah, Tom Watson has sworn a blood oath to Zionism basically. Of this scourge. Obviously, that's miles apart from what the Labour Party is officially saying, but does that give you any confidence, then, in, in staying within the party? It's been more than a year since the Jewish community took to the streets in Parliament Square to protest enough was enough. It's been more than a year since the... Um there was about 30 of them, I remember. There was about 30 morons standing there with the Israeli flags, fucking idiots, and they tried to make it out or look like there was dozens, that there was hundreds. There was a few morons saying, for the many, not for the Jew, which is a play on Labour's great slogan, for the many, not the few. For the many, not for the Jew. We see, the Jewish voice for Labour would dispute that, but they're not being mentioned this morning. Why? Why is Rupert Murdoch Sky News not saying... You're not speaking for everybody, Peter Mason. Since the um, Jewish community met with the leader of the Labour Party and with his senior staff to ask him to take some serious actions. It's been more than a year since we met with the General Secretary to lay down what those actions look like. In the intervening period, quite literally nothing has happened. And as the Sunday Times quite clearly demonstrates, rather than... That's uh, Rupert Murdoch's Sunday Times, by the way. An ...action being taken, we have <laughs> a consistent obfuscation and denial of a problem. Denial to the extent that we are now in a situation... Where They're going to make anti-Semitism in the Labour Party denial a criminal offence. Not just Holocaust denial. Anti-Semitism denial will be a criminal offence in the future. If you say publicly or on any radio station or television channel that anti-Semitism is not really happening, that will warrant your immediate arrest and caution... Caution for the first offence. If you say it again, you'll be banged off to Her Majesty's prison. Strange ways, or somewhere like that. Holy fucking Jesus Christ. Where there are hundreds, hundreds of instances... There are not. ...of anti-Semitism. There's not. ...the Labour Party have either failed to investigate or have completely misjudged and taken boneheaded decisions <laughs> to, to not take the necessary action. Yes, Peter Mason there. He's off now to the Jewish Labour Movement's meeting... Caution for the first offence, beheading for the second, says my friend and colleague, Jean Ann. Yes, that's where we're going, you know. And the worthless media. All you got to do, Stephen, is just, just, it's just, it's just easy. Just one question. What about the Jewish uh, voice for Labour? They disagree with you. We're going to finish today with the script, Al's. It really is vaudeville. I mean, it's madness what's going on. Um, Sunday Express headline on Her Majesty's Secret Service. That's about Prince William going to work for MI5 and MI6 for three weeks. That was a risk, wasn't it? As I said earlier on, the secret files. Yes, what's that about speeding? What's that about chasing her into the tunnel? Yeah. At the Mail on Sunday, Meghan snubbed to Queen's doctors. Prince Harry's bride is pregnant and is about to have a baby. And the Mail on Sunday thinks it's important that you know 
that she doesn't want to use the Queen's doctors. She should use... The, I would use the Queen's doctors. I'd love to have access to the Queen's doctors, to be honest. I'd like to be around for another 125 years. I'm 44 now. So I would say to Megan, use the Queen's effing doctors, love. They'll give you some of that elixir. Charles Rowley um, was exposed to a nerve agent last summer in Amesbury. Remember him? His girlfriend, Dawn Alexander, died allegedly. This is the most bizarre story ever. Charles and Dawn were hospitalised in critical condition in the British town of Amesbury. And the Metropolitan Police went on to claim, as did this government, that they had been exposed to Novichok, the same nerve agent allegedly used in the Skripal poisoning. It's just absolutely ludicrous story, this. After being uh, mysteriously exposed to a nerve agent, you remember the perfume bottle and all that jazz, all that nonsense? Um, Dawn Sturgis tragically died in hospital while Rowley was eventually discharged. This is Charles Rowley. And the UK media told a pack of lies about this man, about him being homeless and everything. Well, Charles Rowley was determined to get some answers. So he went to the Russian embassy in London, met with the ambassador, uh, Mr Yakovenko, and Mr Yakovenko graciously received them and spoke to them. And after he met them, the Ambassador himself, Alexander Yakovenko, spoke to RT. And I've said this before and I've said it again. I love Alexander Yakovenko. I think he's marvellous. He's brilliant. He's ice cool, this guy, when it comes to stating the Russian government's position on this whole Skripal nonsense. Here's the ambassador talking about his meeting with um, Mr. Rowley and talking to him about the death of his girlfriend, Dawn Sturgis. This is great stuff. You'll hear the ambassador. Literally 80% of what I told them was quite a revelation to Charlie and his brother. It's perfectly understandable. They're ordinary people reading British newspapers. What could they know? Only what they're offered by the press. So it's good to have an alternative point of view and understand Russia's line of reasoning. Charlie Rowley and his brother had virtually no info on the questions we directed at the British authorities over the Skripal case. They don't understand why we're not allowed to meet the Skripals. I told them that there was no mobile service connection with the Skripals three hours prior to the poisoning. We had no chance to examine this nerve agent. It was all news to Charlie and his brother. Most of the information they had, they had read in the newspapers. And I got the impression that both the family of Dawn Sturgis and that of Charlie Rowley have not been adequately informed as to what happened to the pair in Amesbury and what happened in Salisbury before. They never received any official reports. The family of the late Dawn Sturgis wants, first and foremost, to see the investigation's conclusions. Russia wants the same thing. It's been a year now and we still haven't seen any official results. What led Charlie and his brother to contact us is precisely the fact that they haven't been able to receive anything from the British authorities. Brilliant, that. He's had to go to the Russian embassy to try and get some answers, has this man Charlie Rowley. I don't have time to go into the ludicrous story that was spun about the perfume bottle and how this man and his girlfriend came to be exposed to um, Novichok. But it's ridiculous to the, to the point that nobody sane could believe it or could run with it as a, a credible story, you know. Um, so, madness, the Skripals. I, I, think, I think it's fair to say that now, in 20... 19 as we come into the spring even those people who get their news exclusively from a mainstream source actually don't believe the Skripal story but they probably don't care either they just put it down to you know messing around between the various intelligence agencies of Russia and the UK most people probably don't care but they should care that such a lie such a nonsense was spun because it was spun to further demonise and ostracise the Russian government because of the Russian government's stated position, not only on Syria, but also on Iran, and now, of course, on Venezuela. It's very interesting stuff coming out of the Russian embassy there. Right, um, that's it for Sunday View. Thanks for listening to it, by the way. If I didn't get to your uh, comments, I humbly apologise. But I did read out quite a few this morning and mentioned uh, many more of them. So uh, these are the damned. I didn't mention him. How you doing, pal? Uh, nice to see you there. Andy Newman as well. And Sue, Starlighter Lady. How you doing, Sue? My old man says, Richie, there will come a day when it will be a crime to even say the word Israel. Thanks so much for that, Sue. And thanks for listening. 
a dear listener. Love these uh, chats on Sunday mornings. I'm away today, but I'm back with you tomorrow, Monday at 5pm UK time. I've got some brilliant guests for you this coming week. Peter Paul Parker, what a lovely man. What a gentleman and what a learned man. Peter joins the programme tomorrow in the second hour for a fascinating conversation about health that you really don't want to miss. I will have a guest in the first hour as well. Packed old week for you coming up. In the meantime, enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Do get away from the news and the telly and your phones and get out and about if the weather is nice because it is going to be nice in most parts today. So get outside, yeah? Look after yourselves and one another. I have been Richie Allen. Bye for now. Leaving you with the Mavericks and dance in the moonlight. That's good. See you you tomorrow.